Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Claire and I work at Green Meadow Community Farm in Cumbrian in South Wales. Um, like everyone else, we had to lock down at the end of March 2020 and had to learn very quickly how to get content from what we're doing at the farm um, to our visitors and the general public um, over social media. So we've got a Facebook page that's got a fair few followers and most of the team we're good at um, doing little video clips and putting those on Facebook with a little um, introduction about what we're doing and things like that. Um, but we wanted to get a bit more detail out there. And I suppose the first um, time I had a go at making a video was when we were asked to do a video of the Stickman Trail um, last year. So uh, not really being at all any good at doing videos and things like that. I had to learn very quickly and it was just a case of looking at what apps were available on the phone for doing video editing. Um, so I found a video app, video editing app called Filmix, which I just found on um, Google Play, downloaded that and it was fairly easy there, just trial and error, putting your videos together. So we take little video clips of things around the farm and photos, go into the video editing app um, and add the video clips and the photos that you wanted and it just put them into a whole video in itself for sort of about five or 10 minutes long, however long you wanted it. And then there are options then to add text um, or music um, and effects and things like that, just to make it more interactive and enjoyable to watch. And that was the way we got the videos across then. So we've done them with stick man, we've done them for school groups. Um, and then recently we've started doing virtual tours for the school, school groups. So we start off by sending them a video of what's been happening on the farm lately and then we go and do a live session either through zoom or microsoft teams or google meet where we'd send the school an invite um, to an appointment at the farm the school group would then join and we can take them on a tour around the farm um, on your phone really and answering all their questions which has been very popular we've done quite a few now over the last few weeks and we've got some lovely feedback and oh, I'll show you here we've got some thank you cards sent from the school that we did last week <laughs> we've got a whole load of those <laughs> so the schools are really enjoying it which is really good to hear um as I said I was a bit, bit of a technophobe before last year uh, as I say it was a case of learning very quickly on how to go about things so if you've got any questions feel free to ask and I will try and answer to, to say how I went about doing them. Thank you, Claire. Um, we'll head over to, to Jeff um, and then we'll take some um, Q&A at, uh, at the end, if that's all right. Thanks. Was I on mute then? Did you not hear that? Okay, right. right I'll start again. I'm. It's a highly professional. This. I'm. I'm Jeff from Pathways Care Farm in Lowestoft in Suffolk, and I. Um, I'm as was announced at the beginning by Alison. I'm. I'm a, a graphic designer before I was a care farmer, so I've done a fair bit of video work and and photography in my career. Um, so when lockdown hit, I've always done little videos for our own consumption of things that are going on on the farm. But when lockdown hit, I, uh, I decided that we needed to connect with people who used to come, but were no longer able to. And I started to produce short videos of life on the farm. And I, it kind of grew from there. I put them on, on uh, YouTube and I noticed that we were getting more subscribers subscribers than we had participants used to come to the farm and then people would uh, tell me that they were now showing it in their care home where their parents were and they were putting it on the big screen and all the residents in the care home were watching so I think like you know in, in those early days of lockdown we were all playing around and trying to work and it became quite evident that the virtual was not as good as being there, but actually if you couldn't be there, it was better than nothing else. So um, it kind of grew and grew. And I 
I think one of the things, I've, what I've done is I've tried to make a few notes. Obviously, I don't know the capability of you guys. You, there's quite possibly people who are viewing here who might be far better at this than I am. So I apologize if I'm saying anything that, that is below you, but I'll give you a few tips from where I'm coming from. And, and then uh, as Claire said, we'll take questions and, and uh, we can actually find out where you really want you know, answers that you need. But um, I think one of the things that you, you need to be bear in mind is that it, it's not always easy just to stand in front of a camera and talk. Even if you're a good talker, you can dry up, you're not quite sure, you know, there's lots of ums and ahs and that kind of thing. And it's really important that before you start, you have a bit of a clear idea of what am I saying in this message? This is not a very general message. I'm going to do five minutes and it's going to be about the donkeys. So let's just focus on that. It can be helpful if you make a little script for yourself to even storyboard it. Say, well, I'm going to start with a long shot. I'm going to come in and, and I'm going to show you walking into the barn, see the donkeys see the mess that they've made of it last night and then how we clear it up and all that kind of thing um i once did a video last year of we had some blue tits that were nesting in a box in our courtyard and we saw them when they would the mum and dad were just going in there and making the nest so i just put a camera a video camera in the courtyard and we turn it on for a few hours every day and over three weeks i put together a sort of a 10 minute video showing the eggs being hatched, um, the feathers appearing on the little babies, and then right up to fledging. Uh, it, was, it, I, it was my favorite film of all the ones that I did last year. Um, so I think thinking about what you want to talk about and thinking of how you can make that interesting for an audience. Uh, if you watch television programs, adverts are brilliant at this because adverts get a whole message into 30 seconds. See how they change the angles. See how they do a long shot and a close up. There's, in terms of being a viewer watching this stuff, there's probably not much worse than just having someone doing a selfie for five minutes with the hand shaking and all that kind of stuff. Um, and you're trying to remember what to say and it's, it's not flowing particularly well. I think we've probably all seen videos like that. So um, I, I often will use a tripod uh, halfway through the year, I bought myself a gimbal. I don't know if any of you have come across a gimbal, but they're amazing handheld devices that, that you fix the camera to or, or your phone. And they work on gyros so that as you move, even if you shake, it moves very slowly and the picture flows. It doesn't look much. It makes the whole thing look much more professional. Absolutely brilliant. When I did tours around the farm, I could hold the gimbal out in front of me and just walk through through the woods or through a field with animals and the camera would very slowly move with me and it wasn't jerky it was it was much more smooth um lighting lighting is really important um if you've got strong light behind you then it's going to be shining into the camera if the camera is there and you might end up in silhouette or the, the picture's not very vivid. Whereas if the light's behind you, I do, as I said, I apologize if, it's, if I'm talking far too basic. Uh, I'm just trying to give some practical tips that I've learned along the way. But if the light's behind you, then actually the light is on the subject that you're videoing. And, and that's um, uh, really helpful because you get the best colors and you get the best definition. Uh, and if you're gonna get there, then make sure the, the sun is in your eyes. So, you know, try not to be squinting, but have a cap or, or a, a bit of shade so that you can actually see the camera. Um, and, and don't just stare at the camera for too long. Do a bit, record your voice, oh, you know, so that you've got the recording that you want, but then find moving pictures that you can put and then dub it. So when you, I'll get on, on to editing in a minute, but edit so that you can actually get the voiceover with clips of what you want to show whilst you're talking. And you can throw a little bit of yourself talking in there. Um, yeah, shadows on faces, those kind of things. Shadows are one of the worst things with really bright light um, because the camera goes a bit funny. You get, uh, it, it 
it doesn't handle strong light and strong dark in the same shot very easily. Most cameras don't, unless you've got incredible equipment. Um, framing the shots, it's, it's really worth taking a bit of time to look into the viewfinder, either it's on your phone or on a special camera, and seeing what it is that you're, how are you framing this? Is there something that's actually, that you don't really want a compost bin, it's right in the way, and you know, you, you could do with that, just move it a fraction, or move the compost bin, um, that kind of thing, just to frame the shot the way you want it. Um, you want the, you want to direct the shot towards what you want the viewer to, to, to see. So be thinking through your script. At this point in my little video, in my story that I'm telling, what do I want them to be seeing? If it's a close up of a baby animal being born, you know, you want to see the action. You want to be, it, it might be on a zoom, but you just want to focus on that area and try and do away with the distractions around the edge. It might be that you want a big shot with the whole thing, with the look at those clouds, you know, the, the weather's dramatic, you know, that kind of thing. You can tell amazing stories through pictures. Um, slow movement. We've all seen it where, you know, you get video of, of someone's wedding and, and the camera's sort of going like this and all over the place. Um, it's really important to try and hold it still for as long as possible. And, and that's quite a technique to learn how to do so that you're not shaking, even if you have to sort of lean against the wall to anchor yourself. Um, if you've got a gimbal, it's slightly easier. But slow movements, when you pan, pan at a certain speed that's not going whiz, you know, round to there. Um, and then um, editing. Editing is, is, Claire mentioned some software that she got hold of, and that's good. I, I'm blessed that I, because I've done this professionally, I, I, I use Final Cut Pro, which is quite an expensive software, um, and not everyone would be able to use that. Um, it's, if you can't, there's, there's iMovie, if you've got a Mac, um, there's others that are cheap versions. It's worth looking at the tools that you can use for editing, because things like it's, it's almost impossible for you to do a one shot video that's gonna be perfect. So you're gonna almost indefinitely have lots of video that you wanna cut out, lots of sound that you wanna cut out. Like I said, you can record a whole 10 minutes of your voice, but then only show a close up of you for, for half a minute and then show shots, but you need to be able to dub that and, and make the, um, the editing work. So I can answer specific questions about the software that I use but it's really worth looking at software that would suit you and your purposes. And it really depends on what kind of video you want to produce, what kind of film you want at the end of the day. Um, and um, the other thing I've said, the last point is just looking for interesting angles. It's so easy to think, well, I'm, I'm going to show this because this is what I see with my eyes. But actually, if you climb on a ladder and look down on something, it's fantastic. Or get right down in the grass and look up. You know, we had some baby kids, goat kids, and I got right down in the grass and you can just see their noses coming down right by your face. Very different dramatic picture. Um, so look at long shots, close ups, angles, high up. Um, even silhouette is good sometimes if you've got, if it's valid for the point you're making. So there's a whole load of stuff to digest there. Um, and hopefully some of it's interesting, but maybe, you know, ask some questions uh, and let's, let's answer what you need to know rather than what I want to say. That's great, Jeff. Thank you both of you for, uh, yeah, just giving us a, a fantastic introduction. So we know kind of where you're at and um, some really useful like starting point tips. Just a few tips that I had from my very, very limited videoing experience based on Jeff's thoughts. Um, they're around sound in particular. So um, Jeff's obviously talked about dubbing there and I'm sure he'll, he'll be able to uh, enlightens a little bit further on that um, but wind <laughs> um, makes an incredible amount of noise and overtakes everything else that's, that's being recorded so you do have to be really conscious of uh, not just the light on your day but what what weather's going on around wind and what other noises might be in the background 
Um, and then the other thing around making sure that there's no compost heaps in the background, I'm sure that all of your sites are absolutely safe 100% all of the time. But really, you do not want to capture people doing things that they should not be doing in the background of your pictures, of your videos. So people climbing to heights that they shouldn't be climbing, people carrying things that they shouldn't be carrying, particularly at the moment with social distancing, you want to really make sure that those kind of images that are being captured for prosperity, prosperity aren't being um, aren't being captured on your site of things that that aren't that aren't the norm but but maybe maybe there so just being aware of what's what's going on in the background on your site um robbie do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question directly uh yes well basically because um i'm i'm, I'm doing short videos for a charity that i work for and uh, there is a, something that's called sequencing which i can of research how to do it there are certain shots that you actually have to film and they have to follow certain story uh, but i haven't found any explanation how to exactly incorporate that sequence into a final uh into a final film final movie so i was wondering if you have any tips how to incorporate the sequence into a movie um what software are you using for uh, for doing your editing uh i'm using both I'm using uh, iMovie Pro, uh, which is uh, brilliant for actually doing shortcuts, uh, like a short uh, short clips. Uh, but once I actually uh, editing everything together, uh, I'm using uh, the um, the Adobe Pro. Uh, what's it? Cut Pro. Actually. Final Cut Pro. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. one. Okay. So when you do your sequencing, what format is the output from that? Oh. Uh, that I wouldn't know. Okay, because that's, it seems to me that uh, from where I'm coming from, the way I would try and incorporate it into what you're doing is when you do, finish your sequencing, get it to be, output that as a file. So you could output the okay. whole sequence as, um, as a dot .movie file or as another format, and then you mm -hmm. can import that into your overall timeline within mm -hmm. Final Cut. Okay. You think that might work? Uh, yeah, but that's just. Uh, but I'm um, more of uh, like, uh, how did that story supposed to be aligned when you're actually creating a sequencing for for a movie? What do you mean by aligned? Are you thinking of? Well, where... uh, if, if when you're doing a sequencing, you're just taking a lot of pictures. Really, like you're just taking a lot of shots. 10 seconds each of, of the face, of the hands, of the, uh, of the all sorts of angles, right? Yep. And is there in how you actually putting them together and how they're supposed to work together with, with the movie in the bigger picture? Okay. I, well, I think that comes down to your storyboard of how you want to tell the story and how those close-ups and how those individual shots fit into mm -hmm. what you want to do as an overall. Um, but, I mean, let's... I, I'm guessing here, but let's say we were doing a feature about an animal and we've shown them grazing mm -hmm. in the meadow, we've shown them you know, running around the field or something, but then you wanna show this sequence of shots that you've taken. So you've got a whole load of different yeah. shots. Um, if you can combine them through, I mean, in, in Final Cut, you can import individual shots and blend them so that they actually mold, go from one to the other, they fade in and out. So they, one transitions into the other. Are yeah. You, are you familiar with transitioning? Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that, I mean, I'm, I'm, the, the difficulty for me is trying to understand exactly what you want to achieve. If, if I was sitting at a computer with you, we could work it out. Um, but I'm thinking if you've got a whole load of stills that you want to have as a sequence and you want to fit them into a timeline of a story. Mm -hmm you could transition them. You could just have one that blends into another one, into another one, into another. Or you could even have them so they're all on, on the screen together as, as a multiple screen with lots of stills that, that move around. There's lots of different ways you could do it. Mm -hmm. And I think it, we're getting quite technical, um, which we could take up the whole of the rest of the, the, the session with technicalities. But I think uh, maybe, you know, get my email address and we'll talk later. Yeah, uh, just, is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you very much. No trouble. Thank you very much for staying. Thank you. Um, one of the questions 
Um, Sharon, I'm going to come back to your question later, if we could focus on recorded content um, first, if that's all right. Um, one of the questions, um, or one of the things that you raised quite a lot in your um, your discussion there, Jeff, was around dubbing. And I don't know whether, Claire, you've got any thoughts on this as well, um, but that's something that I've definitely struggled with kind of in editing before is how do you split them and how do you make sure that they're going over and any any tips that you've had from your experience of getting the voice over over the images and moving moving them around a little bit Claire do you want to head off first on that one absolutely I, I think obviously Jeff has got more expertise on this so mine has <laughs> been more trial and error than anything with the app that I've been using um, and like uh, Jeff was just saying about the sequencing what I've done is all the video clips and photos that I've taken on my phone that I want in this bigger video clip, I'll put into a folder of its own on my phone's gallery. So then when I go into the video editing app, um, I can choose that folder and choose the photos and video clips to add in the order that I want them. So that then will make the whole video. Uh, and again, on the one I've been using, there's the option then to um, get rid of all the background noise of the videos that are on there. So then you can add music or add a voice clip or whatever. Um, and you can choose then the time that you want the music, the time that you want the voice clip. So what you're saying is corresponding to the picture on, on the video. Um, so that's um, an option in the app that I've been using. That's lovely. Um, Thanks, Claire. Yeah, so hope that helps. <laughs> That's really helpful. And in terms of um, someone's just said about a, a short video length, I mean, I would always recommend three to five minutes max. If you were editing something that was uh, kind of the final product was going to be about three minutes, how how much kind of content might you need to to get that in the first place? And how long might it take you to edit it? Or how long would it have taken you last May? And how long might it take you now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got slightly better. Um, <laughs> I probably starting off with when I did that stick man one, it probably took me a few hours just to get to grips with the, the app itself, filming all the bits and pieces to put together. I suppose as we've gone on and I've done the ones for the schools, um, it was good because you can use the same video and put them in different orders and just put a different uh, voice clip over the top of them to make them all individual. So I suppose you don't have to film so much as you're going along. Um, it could probably take me now, I don't know, 20 minutes, half an hour maybe to do a video clip for about three to five minutes long. So I've got better. That's, that's really encouraging because it, it is something that is really time consuming when you're first starting out in particular. Um, but, um, you know, do, do you invest that time? So it's really great to know that it, it does, get, does get quicker. Jeff, any, any thoughts on... I've lost my train of thought on, on dubbing <laughs> voiceovers, what you might want to include other sounds, free free sounds that could go in as well. Yeah, there are free sounds. I mean, I found I was out on a walk on Sunday and it was a glorious day because we had such horrible weather and I was in a really quiet place on a, on a marsh and there were no traffic noise and the birds were incredible. Well, one of the difficulties that I have here on the farm is that we've, we're fairly close to roads. So getting good bird sound even though it's natural, you've got traffic going on. So as Claire was saying, you often want to get rid of all the sound on your own track, just show the visual and then dub some other sounds onto it. So I, you could call it a cheat, but actually the BBC do it all the time. I recorded on my phone, the birds tweeting all around me. It was absolutely gorgeous and there was no interruption. So I've got about a minute of bird song and I can bring that in and put that on a, shot of our sensory garden or something like that and it sounds like the birds are tweeting there which they were but you can't hear the traffic uh, and i think in terms of voice the hardest thing when you're talking you have to be really professional to be able to speak even for three minutes really succinctly so you're almost certainly going to film it five times you're going to um and ah you need to cut those bits out Using cuts in the video is a great way of changing where the dialogue is. You, you start talking and you, you know you've got a point you want to make, but you go into play um and ah, or you go off on a tangent and you've forgotten what you wanted to say. Keep going, record it all, 
And then when you come to actually splice it together, you cut out the bits you don't want, leave the bits you do want. Occasionally you have to re-record, but it's all down to that editing. I mean, I, I'm impressed if Claire can do something in 20 minutes. I, uh, I maybe Final Cut is, is quite complicated, but I normally, to get 10 minutes of video, I would spend almost a minimum of an hour um, editing that. And that's without importing all of the files because some of mine are really complicated. I, I wouldn't recommend anyone going straight in with what I've done, um, but it's, uh, it's an incredibly wonderful process when you really give yourself to it. You've got to have time to, to even finding the right weather conditions to, to film. Um, it's, uh, yeah, and, and animals, if you're doing animals, they don't do what you want them to do when you want them to do it. So you, you could film for hours for animals and, and then, you know, you only get two seconds of what you, oh, why didn't they do that just now, you know? Um, so it's, um, yeah, I don't, I don't find it a very quick process, um, but it's, I find it a very enjoyable process. Um, and if you get enough footage, you might end up making three films out of one set of recordings. So that's the other thing. I think that's that's really important, actually. I think um, I, I think it was Janine who mentioned earlier about the length of a film. Kind of three to five minutes is is kind of the recommended length of time that you probably want to attract people's attention, particularly via social media. You know, if they're engaged a little bit more fully via your website, they might be there for a bit longer. But there's no reason why you can't make multiple films you're much more likely to engage with sh with multiple short films maybe with a slightly different focus on each one uh, rather than going for the whole long hog um something that claire's done that i liked um in one of the stickman videos that she did for us um where she kind of took us on a tour around the site um was to, to kind of get a real feel for the site which is quite a big site <laughs> um but not with without kind of jumping so you didn't miss huge bits. She did a, a speeding up section, which I really liked. Um, and that can be a really, really useful feature. Do you want to, I mean, that's, that's a fairly simple edit, but is there anything else you wanted to say on that, Claire? Yeah, that was, um, I just used hyperlapse on my camera and say so walk from one end of the farm to the other, which took, I don't know, say three minutes to walk it. But what was it, about five seconds on the video? Was it wasn't very long at all. Um, so yeah, hyperlapse was just all that I used and it, it speeds it up for you. And uh, that was it really. But that can be a really useful tool. Like um, me and Jeff's been talking about storyboarding here in particular, we are thinking about creating a tour of your site to really show someone you, who hasn't been to your site before. So you wanna show all the important bits and how you get around them, but that is gonna involve going around the compost heap, which some people do think is very important and undoubtedly is. Um, but um, also they might not be the, the thing you really want to show on your um, on your video so much. So um, using that kind of speed up, but being aware that you can do that when you come to the editing later is really, really useful. OK. I'm going to unmute um, Jeff again because I think his, his phone's gone off. Um, Jeff or Claire, have either of you done um, live videos? Could we could we have a yeah, little bit of a, a discussion farm. about them? Would that be all right, Claire? Yeah, that's fine. Um, as I say, we mainly use Microsoft Teams at the farm, um, but because I've been doing them on my phone, I can use whatever the schools are using. We're doing the live videos for the school groups, um, so we've used Microsoft Teams and Google Meet, um, but Zoom is an option as well if they want to. Um, <laughs> So getting in touch with the schools, they would either send us an invite to the session or we would send them an invite. We both joined like we have here this afternoon on the meeting. Um, and then obviously there's an option to turn the camera around to face the farm. So they're not looking at me all the time that I can, you know, pan around with the, the, the phone's camera just to see the animals. And as I'm walking around, showing them the animals, talking about them, telling them what they're seeing and then they usually last around 20 minutes, half an hour. Some have gone up to an hour, actually, walking around the farm. They just want to see everything, and we're back and forth, back and forth. I'll turn the camera back around to me, and they can ask me their questions. I'll answer them. Um, yeah, as I say, they've been really popular, the live sessions. 
That's lovely. Thanks, Claire. That's um, so that, that's one way of doing it, definitely around kind of having booked in sessions. And that could actually work really nicely if you haven't got too many people on. You've got a specific day and you've got a few volunteers around on the 5th of June, for example, and you wanted to give people an in-depth introduction to your site. Or if you've got um, maybe more vulnerable people who aren't quite willing to come down and they want to do a booked in session is really, really nice. And obviously, you've got you can use YouTube and um, Instagram and uh, Facebook Live as well. Um, Jeff, have you used any of those um, those features? We've used um, we've used FaceTime uh, a few times where we've just had um, one or two other people that we've done it with. Tried it with WhatsApp live because someone didn't have FaceTime, and that was okay. But the signal wasn't quite as good. We've got quite good coverage with us, but you're really limited to the Wi-Fi quality of of the audience. Um, it's not the same as having it as a recorded thing, but it's it's great for. We did it with um, some people who were in a care home, and we were able to say to them, "What would you like to see?" And they said, "Can we go and see the alpacas?" So I actually carried my phone, walked over, or my it was the iPad, um, and walked over towards the alpacas and pointed out which one was which, um, and they could see what I was seeing, and and that was on the the screen at the. Uh, at the care home. So that was one of the, the um, staff at the care home were helping them to make that operate. So that was really good. And it's, um, it's something that we're looking at more and more now because I, I think in this day and age, you have to be able to do that. Um, you just need a good Wi-Fi setup. That's the big problem with live. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, we found that here. Um, the Wi-Fi works in the animal house, but as you're walking around from different sections, the Wi-Fi cuts in and out, so I'm lucky. I've got unlimited data on my phone, so I just use data instead. But obviously, it depends on what contract you're on and whether you're willing to do that, I suppose. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I've, I think particularly with a tour where you are really trying to see the whole site, you're really limited if you're trying to do something live. We did deliver a um, webinar back in um, August, just around general um a kind of video content so that was a little bit of an introduction just to creating video and also um one of our colleagues in ireland um who's been delivering um uh kind of facebook live sessions she was using um so i will share the tips that uh, they put together from that but i think uh, facebook live or or instagram or youtube can work really well um for kind of garnering a following and for maybe demonstrations um in a, in a fixed place um but as jeff's mentioned the animals probably won't perform and as claire's mentioned you know across the site it's going to be quite tricky um so possibly doing a kind of a booked in session would be a little bit better there because then at least you're only disrupting one other one audience at a time if there are if there are any technical issues yeah um sharon's just, just talked a, about, oh sorry I've, jeff, sorry I've just seen a question from sharon yeah uh, is there any way to block other noises um, you can get shields that go around microphones. Again, you're getting into something. If you're on a phone, it's very difficult. You can't stop the noise and it picks up everything. Um, whereas if you've got a camera with an external microphone, you can get special, um, I call it my furry mouse, just fits on the top and it cuts out the wind noise. Um, and you can pay quite a lot of money for those. You know, on the, they have them on booms. With The other thing you can do for only recording your voice is to have a clip mic. So if you can get a clip mic that you can just put quite close to your face, that will often be quite directional and, and you can just speak, it will record you and it will pick up the outside noises much less. So that it's a very good point because there's nothing worse. Um, one of the things I did, if, if people did watch some of my YouTube videos from last year, the early ones I recorded live so I would talk and do a dialogue while I was walking around the farm. But then the noise would often, or birds or cars or anything, and you couldn't cut it out. So what I then started doing was recording everything. Occasionally I talked to tell me what I wanted to remember to say. And then I would delete all the sound from the video and I'd do a voiceover separately in the quiet of my room with just, uh, I used the microphone, the, the recording thing on my phone. And I just sit it there and I watch the video and I do a dialogue uh, over the video. 
and then I dub that onto it. So that's another way of trying to get much less interference of sound. Yeah. And a lot less pressure as well on yourself. I mean, also, I mean, this this kind of headphone set can work quite well. It's much more directional. So if I'm in a large room or something, it's much better. This is like, you know, £13 from Curry's, um, just a, a, a kind of gaming headset. I only You only get half the headset, unfortunately, but that's that suffices. Um, so anything that can, you can kind of direct the, the sound a little bit. Um, but... I mean, obviously, Sharon, you're talking about live there, but recorded with us with a voiceover is is definitely a, an easier way to go about. Um, Nina talking about using Kindle Fires as a uh, I mean, I'm sure you can record video on a Kindle Fire phones nowadays and, and iPads and any kind of tablets are so sophisticated in terms of this. I mean, obviously, I, I imagine Jeff's got a camera and all, all the shebang, but you can achieve so much with with a, um, a video phone. Have either of you got experience of using Kindle Fire? I haven't. No. No. Sorry, Nina. <laughs> I'm afraid <laughs> you know, leave that one un un unanswered unless any, any of the other participants have got any experience of using them. I imagine it's just a case of finding out what the app that suit uh, that um, meets that there. Um, I personally don't have any Apple. Um, and in the Apple devices, but I know that the iMovie um, app is very is very good and well well received. Robbie, did you want to say something? Well, well one of the first advice actually I had from a, a, a professional uh, video maker was to invest money in a microphone, and that was the first thing because you can shoot anything from a, a good camera or a crap camera. It doesn't really matter what camera it is, but when the sound is bad, it's all bad. Bad. That's the basically bottom line. So um, <clears throat> I got myself a Bluetooth one. Uh, this is basically just the stick. It costs something like uh, 30 pounds. It connects to pretty much every phone and you're clipping this around your face right here and you just talk. Yeah. And, and it does make massive, massive difference uh, in the quality of your video between I just recording this from from your phone, but I I record all of my movies. I'm not professional from uh, Google Pixel Three, which is basically five years old phone, and it's pretty much okay, as long as your sound is good. <laughs> Lovely, thanks, Robbie. Um, Thank you. Maybe that's that's really useful. If you could let me know what that's called, and I can share it with everyone else as well, because that sounds like a, a reasonable budget that people if they're slightly interested might be able to stretch to as well there um buy some shares buy some shares in it before you put it local you know public <laughs> <laughs> there's only 18 of us here and i think we're gonna <laughs> send the stock market that crazy <laughs> um and i mean that's that's something else as well in terms of equipment and and what you have obviously you're wanting to invest um kind of sensibly and we're all working on tight budgets um but something as well in terms as well as cost it, when I know when I first started editing some videos, I was trying to use some of the um, the editing equipment, which was far too sophisticated for me, and I just got overwhelmed. And there's so much that you can do. Um, you know, you could you could be there for for weeks editing a, a video and making something fantastic, um, but you don't have to be. You can create something much more simply and um, and and just to kind of not be overwhelmed by it and and take it one step at a time and not try to make you know, kind of the next Warner Brothers blockbuster um, when you're first, um, when you're doing your first one. Um, I would just encourage you on that and that, you know, there is so much content out there now um, that, um, you know, just putting something out there is, is really beneficial and, um, and it's cool, just a great way to introduce um, people who haven't been to your site to the, the things and the sights and the smells of, of, your, of your space and making them feel a little bit like more when they go there for real life, um, that they feel a little bit more at home straight away. Um, so it can be a really useful tool for that. Were there any other questions that anyone had? We were kind of a bit ahead of time, so um, uh, that, that's fine. But if there is any brains that people wanted to pick or anything else that Jeff and Claire wanted to share? I was just thinking, on, based on the title of the, of the session, uh, about a virtual tour of your site there's depending on the size of your site but even if you've got a small site with not very much there's lots of different ways of showing off that and I would say you could uh, instead of just thinking of a tour as being a walk around and looking at 
the out, you know, you, there are lots of aspects. So again, going back to the idea of the angles, if you do, um, I've, I've done tours here where I've done a walk literally around the boundary um, and I've talked about it and what you can see from different angles. But then I've done other things where it's been much more close up. So I'm focusing in on the wildlife. Uh, so there might be butterflies and bugs and, um, and the bird life and all that kind of thing. Or um, choosing a particular theme like woodland and walking through the woodland bit and where there's glades and that kind of stuff. Um, and trying to mix up your messaging because uh, a tour can be so interesting, even on a small, if you've only got a courtyard, but there's going to be things you could focus on details of architecture or, or inscriptions that are somewhere or where does that door lead and tell a bit of a story about it. Try and be a bit imaginative. I, 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 it's so difficult when you don't know who the audience is because I, I really don't want to sound like I'm a great expert and other people don't know what they're doing. I'm sure there's some fantastic creativity out there. Um, but I'm just trying to think of anything that might throw up some ideas. Um, I really like that idea, it, Jeff. Yeah. Yeah, okay. that's great. And, and um, I'm just thinking as well a bit more along that, you know, doing a tour from different people's perspectives. So you may be the one that's creating the video, but, um, you know, with everything on our sites, it's, it's all about involvement of people and getting other people involved in these things. And so asking other people what they think is the highlight of your site or what do they notice or how do they travel? Um, what height are they at? Um, what speed did they go? Those kind of questions and, and what would they include? Um, and, and that could be really useful. And maybe there's a lot of things that you haven't noticed about your site or that um, you thought were important and other people don't, um, just to make sure that it's, it's a bit more interesting to to the general public because sometimes we, we get a bit fix, fixated on something that other, doesn't interest other people does it but now I really like the, those thoughts Jeff thank you around the, around thinking about what a tour actually is. One of the other things that I've done is uh, I've because I was always every few days I was looking for another theme of what to do and I, I interviewed a lot of our volunteers uh, and on another occasion I interviewed a number of our farm workers our, our service users uh, with their permission but with the volunteers I remember I did some in fact there's a, a lady called Claire who's who's on this Claire from women like me um, and I'm just going to embarrass you here Claire because she responded she subscribes to my videos she lives very close to me and she subscribed and she said that was the best one that you've done and I said that's because I don't talk on it isn't it and it was because it was interviewing all the volunteers and it didn't have my voice so, <laughs> Yeah, thank you for that, Claire. <laughs> Absolute pleasure, Jeff. Anytime. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> but can I just say that, that uh, you know, in all seriousness, Jeff, I've watched all of Jeff's videos and, and he's right. The first one was a bit pants. But if you watch his first one and then watch the one, you know, his, his most recent one, you will see just through doing it continually how much better he's got. Um, and I think uh, I had to comment on that one about the with the volunteers, because, I mean, uh, I love the farm, but to hear the benefits from other people's perspective of, of, of what they felt was so poignant. It was, you know, it was it was lovely. So it's great watching Jeff walk around his his farm and blah, blah, blah. But to listen to the people that are actually there and something you said before about uh, Alison, about other people's perspectives you know it, it must Jeff must watch that video and say to himself we are doing a good job here so I think it was really good for him as well that's the only time I've ever complimented him and ever will, but <laughs> <laughs> thanks Claire um just on on that and I, I know Jeff alluded to it as well but um just do, do make sure that if you are featuring anyone in your videos if anyone can be identified that they've given permission to to appear in them and that they're fully aware of where those videos will be used um as well okay so that's important we've got um a consent form I'll try and send that as an attachment um afterwards as well that you can adapt to your for your purposes um but that is really important that you you store it sensitive data someone's image so um, it's really important that you do follow GDPR rules with that. Um, I did send out in the reminder that went out to everyone yesterday there was a link to Jeff's videos but I, I will include that in the um, follow-up email after today as well um, so don't worry about that. 
And um, Pete's talked about using slow mo. So we talked earlier about using speed up. Um, but certainly some some things need need a little bit longer to to dwell on them and to really embed them. So yeah, using slow mo as well. It would be the same feature on your editing software. So either a, a time or a speed or a what did you say it was, Claire? A hyper hyperlapse. But that's that's not in the editing stage. That's when you go into your camera on your phone. You can choose video or photo or panoramic or anything. So on my phone anyway, it's a, a Samsung. You can choose hyperlapse or slow mo, or extra slow mo on mine as well. I think it is. So uh, that's even before you get into the editing stage. Mm. Lovely, thank you. Okay, any final questions, Claire? Oh no, that's a clap. That's not a hands up. <laughs> no, that was sorry. I've clicked the wrong one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um. I am an absolute novice. Uh, I've done one video and someone else edited it. So it's brilliant. Um, and I took, they took about an hour worth and, and got it down to 15 minutes. And I, I've watched it and it's too long. It's definitely too, it's beautiful when he put together, but it's too long. And I do want to try to, you know, to do my own. So being an absolute novice, I mean, I'm a Blackberry girl at heart. So, you know, having a phone that can take uh, pictures and videos is new anyway. Um, I'm assuming you can take your video off your, your phone, put it onto your computer and then do all your editing. You don't do it all on your phone, do you? Oh my God, Claire. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> what a hero. Oh, okay. But you can take it off your phone, put it on your computer and someone's nodding so <laughs> yeah if, if you you can I mean plenty of phones have got the capacity to be able to edit on them I'm, I'm like you Claire um women and me Claire women like me Claire um that I would rather have it on a computer my recommendation would be to make sure your phone is plugged in and try and move it don't try and email it or bluetooth it or send it over because that will just take you kind of three days before you've even got the files on and like Claire said earlier about creating a gallery um and I'm sure Jeff does as well like naming your videos um, and um, popping them all in the same place because the very beginning shot, which will be the one that's saved on your, like your thumbnail, you might not actually have any idea what's in that. And then you have to watch all of that five minute clip to work out what it is. So if you can label them as you're going along, um, that, that's a much easier way of doing it. And then kind of pull them in one at a time um, once your phone's plugged into your computer. Thank you. I think the use of slow-mo and speeding up and all that is, is a wonderful device. But the other thing that's really great is transitions. Um, on most software that you can get now for video, you, you know when you, you watch a shot, and instead of just going one shot, break, next shot immediately, like a hard edge almost, you know, one shot comes to an end and the next stop, shot starts. You can do a lovely soft transition where one fades out as the other one fades in. And they, this is used on television all the time. But you can do all sorts of things where there are transitions where it will almost look like the screen's being pushed across and one shot overtakes another one. Um, you can do things where it all breaks up into, um, it's a bit like some of the transitions you get in PowerPoint, which are usually quite naff. Um, but on some video software, they're really sophisticated and very good. because They've all come from television. So they've just become commercial outlets now. Um, but if you if you don't just have to look at mine, but look up, go onto Google and type in video transitions and you'll see all sorts of ideas. Um, and it's just worth thinking about it because it's a nice way of linking from one thing to another. Um, and sometimes you do want to do a really hard cut because you're going from one scene to something else, a totally different scene. And that's nice to do a hard cut and carry on. Um, and then sticking in captions with words where you don't have to say anything, just put some words in. Um, yeah. I think someone's just said about which software they would recommend you'd recommend for a laptop. I've just been using the free video editor on Microsoft. I have Microsoft installed on my laptop. You have no soft transitions at all. Um, so it's, it's pretty brutal, but you can put sound behind and you can um, do hard transitions and you can put captions over the top. So it's got really basic functionality and it's really easy to use if you've got something that's very, very straightforward. Um, 
and then there is lots of other there's loads of stuff out there if you just google um one of the things that i had did find with um a lot of the software is that you need a you get a license which would be applicable to one machine um so you just need to consider if you're wanting to use it amongst a number of staff or volunteers at your organization you might need to dedicate a single machine for that software um to to, to go on to um, but there are lots of free stuff out there and I would definitely recommend starting with something that's free um, because you'll be able to get enough in, enough out enough out of it as you're first starting and then if it's something you find you want to do more on then you can um, you can invest in something once you know a little bit more what you're looking for mm. okay right I'm going to call it a day there um, I've tried to take a note of everything that we've discussed all the all the um, bits and pieces that have been mentioned all the names um, and I will email them out with a link to this video when it goes live on YouTube, this recording, um, and also a link to Jeff's videos and the Stickman videos that Claire's been um, mentioning there. Jeff, Claire, thank you so much for um, everything that you've been sharing today. Thank you, everyone else, for participating, for um, being present. Um, if you're not already a member of our Facebook group, um, it's a great place to... Um, Kind of raise questions with members like Jeff, like Claire, um, and who've got experience of doing things that you want to do or are working in situations very similar to yours. So do join the Facebook group um, for kind of ongoing discussions as well. Um, I think that's kind of all I've got to say. We've got a members gathering, which is just an informal session uh, where you can come and chat as well on the 8th of June. And um, our next webinar, again, will be in June um, and that is a, a run being run by the growing care farming team um, and that'll be focused on education I'm afraid I can't remember the date off the top of my head so apologies for that um, but yeah thank you ever so much for all your participation this afternoon and uh, we look forward to seeing you at something again soon Great. take care everyone thank you, thank you.